निरंजनम नित्यम अनंतरूपं भक्तानुकंपाधृत विग्रह वै ईशावतारम परमेशमिड्यम तंग्राम कृष्णम शिरसा नमाम ओम जननी सारदाम देवी राम कृष्ण जगत गुरु पाद पद्मे तयो श्रुवा प्रणमा मुहुर्मुहु नमस्तिराजाय विवेकानंद सूर सच्चिद सुखस्वूपाय स्वामीने तापहारिने so after about a two weeks break uh, because of the power outage uh, we couldn't have class for the last two weeks so now we will again continue with our study of swami vivekananda's karma yoga we were in the seventh chapter there are total eight chapters after that another one chapter is there before we for the time being conclude our study of swami vivekananda's karma yoga so in the seventh chapter at the initial uh, part of the lecture the the lecture which is termed as the theme of the lecture is the freedom that swami ji we found at the very beginning described that in our life the idea of freedom that we feel is an illusion actually it's the mind Uh, which is having its fixed stimuli response conditioning it acts as per those fixed stimuli response conditioning it's not the one mind that we think that we have actually the mind has innumerable mental modules as per the circumstance in which we are placed in in life one of those modules gets activated there is no such commander to say that you have to be activated just for the circumstances a particular module gets activated and that module has its own fixed stimuli response conditioning it responds to the circumstances of life as it has been programmed giving us the feeling that we are the one who are deciding so actually it is not we are deciding we are actually the puppets in the hand of prakriti so the question comes where our spiritual journey uh, is if everything is as such predestined by the nature so there after that after giving this introduction swami vivekananda will be now entering into the science of karma yoga that yes in our life if we constantly think that i am free to cho- choose my way of life most probably immediately it's almost impossible to understand from retrospect when you look back you will realize that as if nothing was decided by me the destiny was playing its own a uh, role in forming my uh, the future the prakriti was playing its own uh, role in forming my destiny that's why when someone says that everything if everything is predestined then where comes the question of attempting anything so the answer is yes everything is predestined but before beforehand what's going to happen in the future you don't know most probably it is predestined that through your endeavor you are going to attain such and such things which you can understand only when you have reached that state and look back so the idea of predestination is never fatalistic 
It is not fatalistic in the sense that, oh, if everything is predestined, why should I try? Most, it is because what is going to happen in the future, I don't know. Though it is predestined, I don't know. So it doesn't entail that I try and reach such certain state, which is actually predestined, which I can understand only when I look back. I can never know what's predestined in the future. So it in no way uh, speaks of a fatalistic philosophy. We have to go on trying in our life. And again, there was a question, someone asked a very interesting question, that if everything is predestined, why should one be punished for his crime? It is predestined. Yes, the, now you will find already uh, the idea of punishing the one, the criminal, the philosophy has changed. It's not to punish him. That as per the tendencies of such a, of a particular person, he has, is more prone to, he or she is more prone to destruct others' life, destroy others' life, damage, hurt others. So to protect the society from such damage, which may be incurred because of the tendency of that person. He has to be segregated, not to punish. Because sometimes we know it's so difficult to change our nature. We, throughout our life, the biggest mistake we do, we go on thinking that the others should change. Let us just turn the focus on ourselves and see how much I have changed. It is so difficult to change small habits, small uh, ways of life, so difficult. For if we are thinking about changing ourselves, we find it so difficult, but we think the others should change as I wish. First, we just turn the direction and see how much we change. We ourselves change, it is so difficult. That's why Swami Vivekananda in some other place in one of his lecture has told a very interesting thing that I held, I hold no one responsible for their actions because they're all subject to the whims of the nature. I held no one responsible. And then what is the, the sentence which he's saying is very interesting. The only person whom I can consider to be responsible for his action is a realized soul. He knows, he is above Prakriti. He has the responsibility. Response ability is the responsibility. That how should I respond to a particular situation? As a human being, though we are at present the puppets in the hands of nature, we can go beyond the stimuli response conditioning once when we have that spiritual realization. You may say how it happens? The common example which we give again and again, that how it happens when, when you go to the spiritual realization, you go beyond the stimuli response conditioning. That Swami Vivekananda is giving that example so many times we have cited as it is contextual here. So we are going to cite it again. What that Swami is saying that as a wandering monk, when I was traveling through the deserts of Rajasthan, I was extremely thirsty. I was in search of water. And then I suddenly saw a huge reservoir just at a distance. I started proceeding towards it. It never came near. And after some, some time I found it vanished. And then suddenly it struck me. The idea came, what? But yes, from childhood, I have read about the mirage. In my textbook, I have read about it. After reading, I had the idea, I know what mirage is, but it was just a conceptual knowledge. It was just a concept. I have never seen it in our life. That's what happens even with our spiritual life. I read some books, I hear some lectures and that concept, I think I have understood. But it actually is not substantiated by the realization. So it as such has no effect in our life. So that's why Swamiji, though have read about the mirage, the mirage deluded him. He was drawn by the mirage in search of water. Now, when once he realized, oh, this is the mirage which I've read about. Today, I have realized it. You see a huge reservoir. 
Actually, it's not there. It's a mere projection. Now, what's the difference? The next day, when again I am passing through the desert, again I'm thirsty, again I see. It's not that the previous day I have seen the mirage and knew it to be an illusion. That doesn't mean I won't see that illusion. As I am in my mind and senses, I again see it. But a great difference has happened. What has happened? The stimuli response conditioning has broken. How? Today it cannot draw me. Yesterday I thought it to be real and it dragged me. Today it cannot drag me. I know it's a mere projection. <clears throat> so now you will understand that why Swami Vivekananda is saying that only a realized soul is responsible. He has the... Re <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> One minute. He has the ability to respond to the situation. All others are bound <clears throat> by the stimuli response condition. He alone is responsible. One have realized. No one else is responsible. So here in this situation, where comes the karma yoga? The karma yoga is that yes, as per the situation of life, as per our responsibilities, we are bound to behave in a particular way, take the our duties in a particular way of life, but that need not entail that we should be identified with it. Consciously knowing that the body, the mind, I do not owe them in any way. I don't own them. Just as a part of the flow of the nature, they are there. All the suffering comes when I am identified with the flow. When I am in the stream, drenched in the stream, the Prakriti is like a flow, like a river. I have identified with it. I am in it. I am getting drenched by it. The karma yoga starts, let the flow go on. Let me be apart from the stream, observing it, witnessing it. So the more we can practice that, it's not easy. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Tablar bol mukhe bola shahoj hate ana kutin. That when you start learning to play the tabla, the percussion, the teacher comes and spells out the rhyme, the rhythm, something like ta dhinna, dha dhinna, ta terekete, dha terekete, he spells out and asks you to repeat. In five minutes, you memorize, you repeat it. Now he says, bring it in your hands. It may take months. So just to speak out all these truths which has been spoken of the scripture is so easy. Even a small child can do it. That be detached. But we know, everyone who have really tried, they know it's not easy. It's very difficult. That's why in Katha Upanishad there has been told, Kshurasya Dhara, Nishita Duratyaya, Durgam Pathastat, Kavayo Vadanti. It's not an easy path. It's very difficult. But that doesn't mean difficulty, doesn't mean impossible. Sometimes we just uh, equate impossibility, uh, uh, difficulty with impossibility. To climb the Mount Everest is difficult but it is not impossible to really disidentify ourselves from the happenings of life is difficult. It is not impossible. Just seeing the difficulty someone says, many of us will say these are all impractical things, but know it for certain throughout the history of the spirituality, there are lots, so many examples are there that they have succeeded in detaching themselves from the happening of their life. That's why those lives are so inspiring. Even if we have never studied them, suddenly by chance you go through those lives, you find it inspires you. You feel that's what I want to be. And for that, we have to endeavor. Karma Yoga speaks of that endeavor where I don't run away from life as the word fear, that life with its challenges sometimes 
appears to me as a fear. And that word fear is very interesting. It can be used as an acronym. The spirituality doesn't mean that out of fear I run away from life. Spirituality in no way speaks of running away from life. It's actually the, gives us the strength to face the life. So the word fear, if I use it as an acronym, it can have two meanings. Forget everything and run. Most of us think that's the spirituality. Forget everything and run. That's what Arjuna was trying to do at the very beginning of the Bhagavad Gita we find. But the real acronym of the fear which speaks, which entails in spiritual evolution is face everything and rise. Face the situation of life. Face everything. Don't run away and rise above the situation. That those situations become something small. How small it becomes? Just understand that how the situation becomes small. That in a classroom, a teacher drew a line in the blackboard and asked the students, can you shorten it without touching it? The students never knew that how to shorten it without touching it. I have to just rub a portion of the uh, line to shorten it. I have to just uh, uh, delete a portion of the line to shorten it. How can I shorten it without touching it? And then an intelligent student came and drew a line parallel to that line, a longer line parallel to that line. Now compared to that line, this line becomes smaller, shorter. So you haven't touched that line. That line remains as it is. You have drew another line parallel to that line, a much longer line, and compared to that, this line becomes shorter. So we will find in our life, that we almost have no control over the situations. Sometimes some of the problems of life, we have the capacity to solve. But as we grow older, as we grow older, we will find that the life appears like an adamantine wall in front of me. I was proceeding through the known paths. Suddenly I find there's a wall which I cannot cross or as if I am in the end of a precipice, one step further you fall. So that's the experience which we all have in our life, that the known paths suddenly has as if came to an end. So what's the, this is the way out. The constant, that's the thing that here Swamiji is again and again indicating this karma yoga, is to develop that sense of detachment. And uh, uh, that we will be uh, introducing here that in this life, it, the, what's the karma yoga? To draw the bigger line. The circumstances remain as it is. It is we, in our life we can find, we cannot change the circumstances, but we can bend our attitude. And that bending of the attitude Attitudinal change, change is what Karma Yoga speaks of. So with this introduction, now let us enter into the words of Swami Vivekananda and we will find that when Swami Vivekananda is addressing, he is actually having the Bhagavad Gita in his background. So what all slokas of Bhagavad Gita he is referring to, that also as a reference we will just uh, Illustrate, I will just say so that you can also relate to those slokas of Bhagavad Gita. This all helps us in whatever way that, that a spiritually illumined person is never self styled. He is following a tradition. He is not just out of imagination, he is uh, showing us some path. It is a well proven path based on the traditional philosophy. So that's why we will refer to the texts which Swamiji is having in the background of his mind while delivering that lecture. So now let us enter into the text. So Karma Yoga says, first destroy the tendency to project this tentacle of selfishness. And when you have the power of checking it, hold it in 
and do not allow the mind to get into the ways of selfishness. This again and again, you're attempting that everything, my selfishness is being projected like the tentacles. With each and every attempt, I have to try to bring them back. Pratyahara, which has been spoken of in the yoga. That control your mind, bring it back. This is not that in one attempt you succeed. You have to try again and again. And when this becomes habitual, then you will find that you have become like a leaf, like a lotus leaf in the water. The water cannot touch or adhere to you. So that's what Swamiji is saying. Then you may go out into the world and work as much as you can. Mix everywhere. Go where you please. You will never be contaminated with evil. There is the lotus leaf in the water. The water cannot touch and adhere to it. So will you be in the world. So when Swamiji is saying this, so the sloka, which is heavy, he is having in the background of his mind, the Bhagavad Gita sloka. What is that sloka? It's the 10th sloka of the 5th chapter. Brahmanyadhaya karmani sangam tyaktva karotiya lipyate nasapapena padma patram ivam bhasa. So this is the sloka. Brahmanyadhaya. This is dedicating all your actions to God, to Brahman, to the absolute reality. Brahmanyadhaya karmani. You dedicate all the actions to the Lord. Sangam tyaktva karotiya. Abandoning all attachment. Dedicate that either all the actions, I offer it to the Lord. The thing which you offer, for that, you never think of getting any returns. You have offered. I still remember. And when I was in India, in one of the centers in Northeast, Naruttam Nagar, is a tribal uh, chief who donated that land a huge land, 250 acres land, so that an educational institute can come up. They were the first generation learners at that time. There was no school. Ramakrishna Mission uh, somehow got the goodwill of the people. They were invited to start the school. And those, the leaders, the chief who invited us were really an open-hearted person. They donated 250 acres of land. But the problem started with their successors. The tribal chief who donated, he died, his successors, they will come for all sorts of small favors and always remind the head Swami, Swami, don't forget, it is we who donated this land. The Swami will last, just listen and have a very gentle smile. And very nicely he will tell, if after giving, you don't for, just go on reminding the one who have given that this is the thing I've given you, have you really given? You still have the sense of possession. How can you say you have given? So that's why in our scripture, they say when the right hand gives, the left hand shouldn't know. So when I say I have offered anything to the divine, there's no question of expecting any results out of it. So this too goes hand in hand, offering it to the divine. Immediately, there shouldn't be any attachment. So that's why this both has been spoken of together, Brahmanyadhaya Karmani, Sangan without abandoning all attachment, dedicate all the results of actions to the divine. Do it perfectly. When I offer something to the Lord, it has to be the best thing. I cannot offer when I'm offering the fruit to the Lord. I always check whether the fruit is fresh. I never offer a rotten fruit to the Lord. So whatever actions I'm doing, when I say I offer it to the Lord, it has to be perfect because I'm offering it to the Lord. And after that, I don't seek any result. So Brahman Adhaya Karmani, Sangam Tyaktva Karatiya, the one who can do that, what happens? Lipyate Nasapapena. That no sin can touch him. Padma Pat, Padma Patra Ivam Bhasa. Padma Patram Ivam Bhasa. Just like a lotus leaf in the water. It is in the water, but the water can never touch it. Whenever you pour water on the lotus leaf, it will simply fall off, slip off, 
without a single trace of water drop remaining on it. it simply slips off. It can never drench the lotus leaf. It is still in the lotus in the in the water, but is never drenched by it. So that's the sloka in the Bhagavad Gita, which Swamiji is referring to. Those who dedicate their actions to God, abandoning all attachment, remain untouched by sin, just as a lotus leaf is untouched by water. So after this, Swamiji is saying, is saying that what this unattachment is spoken of as in our, in our scripture, this is called vairagya, dispassion or non-attachment. I believe, I have told you that without non-attachment, there cannot be any kind of yoga. Non-attachment is the basis of all the yogas. The man who gives up living in houses. So now he's saying that by dispassion, we may feel that giving away of the physical things of life. So that in no way is the real dispassion. The real dispassion is the dispassion in your mind how much detached mentally you are. So that will be spoken of now. Non-attachment is the basis of all the yogas. The man who gives up living in houses, wearing fine clothes and eating good food and goes into the desert, may be a most attached person. You see, physically he has given up. He's giving up living in houses, wearing fine clothes, eating good food, goes to the desert, Maybe he's the most attached person. His only possession, his own body may become everything to him. As he leaves, he will be simply struggling for the sake of his body. Non-attachment does not mean anything that we may do in relation to our external body. It is all in my mind. The binding link of I and mind Ahankara and Mamata, I and mine, is in the mind. If we have not this link with the body and with the things of the senses, we are non-attached. Just like King Janaka, the emperor, the king with all the wealth, is the example of non-attachment. Though he is the king, he never gets identified with his own wealth, with his power. So that's the thing Swamiji will indicate now, that a man may be in a throne and perfectly non-attached. So the example of King Janaka, Swamiji is having in the background of his mind. Another man may be in the rags and still very much attached. First, we have to attain the stage of non-attachment and then to work incessantly. Karma Yoga gives us the method that will help us in giving up all attachment, though it is indeed very hard. That's the thing. It is not easy. It's quite hard. It's difficult. But difficulty shouldn't be synonymized. But you shouldn't say the synonym of difficulty is impossible. It is difficult, but it is not impossible. That again and again in our spiritual journey, we find people saying it is impractical. It is not impractical. It is difficult. But it is possible. Impractical means that which is not possible. The moment you say it is impractical, it cannot be practiced, we are making the mistake. In life, we never have learned a single, a single thing in one attempt. When we were a small child, we were crawling to walk. There were so many failures. The constant endeavor, we learned walking. We learned everything in life, life through failures. And when it comes to spirituality, we always look for slipshod remedy. That it should be something like instant coffee. Just, I, what do you say? Mix this, uh, the, script, the scriptural truth like coffee in the hot water and immediately it's ready for me to drink. It's not possible that way. That's why Swamiji again and again is to say that the basic, the, the basic practice sadhana behind all our spiritual endeavors is 3P. Purity, patience, perseverance. Purity is we have to keep the ideal in our mind. If it flows off, it, I get diverted. Again, I bring back this constant attempt to keep the sublime 
inspiring thoughts in my mind is the purity, but it's not easy. I have to persevere again and again, repeated failures. Again and again I try, persevere. And it, it's not, it may not happen in short time. It may take quite a long time. So I have to have patience. So that's why Swamiji is saying it's indeed very hard, but there's no other way than going on trying. So we have to go on trying. Here are the, and now this detachment come in two ways that he will speak of now. The karma yoga, an atheist can also be a karma yogi and those who are believer in God, they can also be a karma yogi. The beauty of karma yoga is even without believing in God, you can attain the heights of the spiritual illumination. That's something Swamiji is asserting. There are two ways. But at the same time, he will mention that without believing in God, the path becomes more difficult. With the belief in God, it, the path becomes comparatively easier. So now let us read to the text what Swamiji is saying. Here are the two ways of giving up all attachment. The one is for those who do not believe in God or in any outside help. They are left to their own devices. They are simply to work with their own will, with the powers of their mind and discrimination saying, I must be non-attached. It's something similar to Stoicism, the Stoics. They also try to be detached without any higher ideal as such in the background of their mind. Just simply to be detached. Never just to be in the present, not to worry about what I have done in the past, not to anticipate in the future, just what I have to do, I do perfectly in a detached manner. That also is a type of karma yoga, but it's not easy. We will find it's that just to become something detached without any higher ideal almost entails that you become like a robot. It's not easy, it's very difficult. You have to have a very strong will. But for those who believe in God, and again in the words of Swamiji, there is another way which is much less difficult. They give up the fruits of work unto the Lord. They work and are never attached to the result. Whatever they see, feel, hear or do is for him. For whatever good work we may do, let us not claim any praise or benefit. It is the Lord's give up the fruits unto him. Let us stand aside and think that we are only servants obeying the Lord, our master, and that every impulse of action comes from him every moment. That's the catch. That every impulse of action comes from him every moment. If it is he who is impelling me to certain action, I become an instrument. Can the pain ever say the pain which is in the hands of an author who is writing books after books, novels after novels, can the pen say, ever say that it is I who have written the book? The one who is holding the pen, he is writing. So it is all the impulse for the actions come from him. That example we give again and again. The mother feels love for the child. If the mother thinks I am loving, she is mistaken. And from that, all the evils come, all the suffering come. The doer, the idea that I am the doer, I am loving, brings the sense of expectation. If I would have felt this love, do I own this love? No. Every, there what to speak of a human being. In this world, any creature, go to the National Geographic, see the videos that the Lord has implanted altruism in each and every being. There are so many videos, what to speak of your own children. There are tiger after killing the, what you say, some a deer. The fawn is helpless for his own, for his own, of, uh, what do you say, for thrive, for, for sustenance. He has to, the lion or the tiger, they're carnivores. They have to pray. That is their food. But after killing the deer, when they see the fawn, they're full of that parental love. They're protecting that. There are so many videos. So this altruism is in our genes. God has implanted. 
the in inter creation you will find the mother is always there to save the child that has been implanted in our heart so can we say i love we cannot just seeing a beggar if you feel like giving a few pence the compassion which has came from your heart what we say oh i am so compassionate are you really compassionate but the compassion which came how it came from where it comes have you really can say that it is i who possesses it it is my character no the lord has made us in such a way that just seeing somebody in need suddenly it comes and i am we are impelled to give something to that person so if in every impulse for action comes from him if altruism was not in our genes creation wouldn't have been possible the entire creation and that's why now the modern findings of biology is challenging the darwin's theory of competition and fight leading to evolution is being challenged again and again throughout nature we find it is the altruism it is the win win strategy it is the synergy it is a synchronized energy where we all come together to just help each other so that the my deficiencies is fulfilled by someone else others deficiencies is fulfilled by me that's a win win situation and that's how the evolution has happened so this impulse for action is from him we have been created that way so how can i just say i want the result so there comes all the suffering so that's what swami is saying but whatever good work we may do let us not claim any praise or benefit it is the lords giving up the fruits unto him so if it is he who is doing through me i'm just the instrument he knows best why he has made me the instrument to take care of his creation in the way he wants i'm just the instrument so why should i go on seeking for the results i have done as an instrument and whatever result that belongs to him he is the doer he is the enjoyer in that sense so for whatever good work we may do let us not claim any praise or benefit it is the lords give up the fruits unto him let us stand aside and think that we are only servants obeying the lord our master and that every impulse this is the catch every impulse for action comes from him every moment whatever now again he will be just referring to the bhagavad gita a particular shloka is in his mind so what first let us read the swami ji's sentence and then we will refer to the shloka the famous shloka of bhagavad gita whatever thou worshipest whatever thou perseverest perseverest whatever thou doest give up all unto him and be at rest so this is the 27th shloka of the 9th chapter of bhagavad gita yat karoshi whatever you do yadas nashi whatever you eat yajju hoshi whatever you offer as oblation to the sacred fire yat tapasyasi whatever austerities you do yat tapasyasi kaunteya tat kurushva madarpanam do it as an offering to me to the divine so yat karoshi yadas nashi yajju hoshi dadasi yat yat tapasyasi kaunteya that kurushu mother param whatever you do whatever you eat whatever you offer as oblation to the sacred fire whatever you bestow as a gift and whatever austerities you perform o son of kunti arjuna o son of kunti do them as an offering to me so that's the shloka which swami ji is having in the background of his mind when he's saying whatever thou worshipest whatever thou perceivest whatever thou doest give up all unto him and be at rest this is a wonderful song of rabindranath tagore tomar holo shuru amar holo shara that be and give it to him and be at rest that the tagore song sometimes are very difficult to understand that from what he is saying that for that he is at whom he is addressing we don't know if you just take the literal meaning he is just saying for you it's the beginning for me it is the end what does it mean it's in a very poetic way that once i offer all the results of action to the lord now all the headache is his 
for him it's the beginning now it's the beginning for you i have offered what are you going to do with my life it is your headache amar holo shara i am at rest so that's the thing that be at rest offer it to the lord make it is his headache and be at rest plus i have given all the results of my action to the best person in the world there is no one better than the lord in our day to day life sometimes we have if we have to faith if we have to some trust we always trust whom i believe to be a nice person and in our life we say i believe in god and our day to day actions shows that we don't believe if i believed him how could i be bothering anymore if i would have if in our day to day life just to some ordinary being whom i believe to be bit better than other in him i can trust and be at rest how can i say that i believe in lord and be constantly bothering it's just contradictory if you think the have believe in the lord as the best person purushottama once i offer everything to him be at rest let him now take care of my life again it's not easy but that's the only way out nanya pantha vidyate yanaya the scripture asserts there is no other way there is a way out of this humdrum called this world i can come out of it but it is through this endeavor nanya pantha there is no other way you have to come out through your endeavor to reach that state of illumination let us be at peace perfect peace with ourselves and give up our whole body and mind and everything as an eternal sacrifice unto the lord just see how wonderfully swami ji is asserting once he has entered into the karma yoga after all those discussions now he is speaking the truth just directly and with full force there lies the power in the words of swami ji instead of the sacrifice of pouring oblations into the fire perform this one great sacrifice day and night but just pouring oblations to the fire is something external is a paraphernalia if you do not reflect the real meaning of it through your practices in your life through the attitude in your life so instead of sacrifice of pouring oblations into the fire perform this one great sacrifice day and night the sacrifice of your little self in search of wealth in this world thou art i found as the only wealth i sacrifice myself unto thee in search of some one to be loved thou art the only one beloved i have found i sacrifice myself unto thee let us repeat this day and night and say nothing for me no matter whether the thing is good bad or indifferent i do not care for it i sacrifice all unto thee day and night let us renounce our seeming self seeming self the idea of the self which i have is a seeming self it's not the real self when someone so asks mommy ji that the so called advaita vedanta speaks of the dissolution of my personality and swami ji is laughingly smilingly reply madam you are not individuals yet when you merge in that absolute then you become individual just see sometimes the words which we use with, without knowing the meaning we use the word the word individual means what that which cannot be divided individual that which cannot be divided individual means that which can be divided when i say i am an individual what is individuality in me constantly my thoughts are changing my emotions are changing i was a small child my body has changed as an adult person i will be growing old what is there that is not individual everything is divided constantly new things are coming up old things are going i am a conglomeration of so many things thoughts emotions my cells my body everything is a conglomeration you become individual when you become immersed in that absolute nothing can divide you you are that absolute reality so how nicely swami ji is saying so that's the thing sacrifice the seeming self the seeing the reflection of the absolute self in the body mind complex i think this reflection to be real and that's how we get drowned in this world of samsara 
that we are all uh, narcissist in spiritual sense. You know, there's a Greek, the word narcissism, the one who is extremely self-possessed, always thinks of himself, nothing else, are called narcissist. The word narcissist from where it came? It came from a Greek legendary character, Narcissus, that he was extremely self-possessed. He was a prince, the royal prince, but he was not at all a responsible person. He never used to take care of his royal duties, he was extremely possessed by his own beauty. He was extremely handsome. Throughout the day, whenever he got chance, he will go to the forest where there was a huge reservoir. He will stand by its bank in the shore of the reservoir and constantly go on seeing his own reflection in the still transparent water. And one day he got so infatuated with the reflection, he thought it to be real. He jumped to embrace it, that it is some real handsome person I want to embrace him. He jumped to embrace his own reflection, drowned and died. In spiritual sense, we are all narcissistic. Seeing our reflection in this body-mind complex, the reflection of the absolute, that seeming self is that reflection. We have jumped into it. We have drowned. And that's the cause of our spiritual death, this worldliness. So we have to renounce our seeming self. That's what Swamiji is saying. Day and night, let us renounce our seeming self until it becomes a habit with us to do so, until it gets into the blood and nerves and the brain and the whole body is every moment obedient to this idea of self-renunciation. So this is the practice. We have to go on again and again, endeavor purity, patience, perseverance. You have to persevere. Go then into the midst of the battlefield with the roaring Karen and the din of the war and you will find yourself to be free and at peace. That's the contemplation in the world of action, in the busy, in the extreme uh, immediate concerns of your life, with the extreme busy, in the extreme turmoil, you can enjoy the peace of meditation if you are a real Karma Yogi. That's the contemplation in the world of action. That's what Karma Yoga speaks of. Let the external, all the humdrum go on, but inwardly I am at peace with myself. The once the detachment comes, that is possible. So go then into the midst of the battlefield with the roaring cannon and the din of war, and you will find yourself to be free and at peace. Karma Yoga teaches us that the ordinary idea of duty is on the lower plane. Nevertheless, all of us have to do our duty. Let we may see that this peculiar sense of duty is very often a great cause of misery. Duty becomes a disease with us. It drags us ever forward. It catches hold of us and makes our whole life miserable. It is the bane of human life. This duty, this idea of duty is the mid-summer sun which scorches the innermost soul of mankind. So duty comes from swabhava. That out of necessity when we do something, we go on doing it again and again. After some time we find what? That it has as if created a path in my mind. I forget the necessity. Just to do it becomes my obsession. And now... That obsession is not only in me, it has become pandemic. It's for all. And to cover that obsession, to cover that corpse called obsession, what we do? We cover it with flowers. The corpse, if you try to cover the corpse with the flowers, what will happen? After uh, just a few moments or few hours, the flower will dry up and the corpse will just come out with all its ugliness. And that's what all the sense of duty is. It's all our obsessions, which has become pandemic. It has become pandemic. And that we try to cover with flowers and name it as our duty. That's what Swamiji is indicating. Look at those poor slaves to duty. Duty leaves them no time to say prayers, no time to bathe. Duty is ever on them. They go out and work. Duty is on them. They come home and think of the work for the next day. Duty is on them. It is living a slave's life. 
at last dropping down in the street and dying in harness like a horse. This is duty as it is understood. The only true duty, now again Swamiji is coming back to the Karma Yoga. If you have to have a sense of duty, the only true duty is to be unattached and to work as free beings, to give up all work unto God. If all the so-called apparent necessities of life have made me obsessed of them, what I, the necessity has, has converted into obsession. All our obsessions are nothing. They are necessities. By repeatedly doing, I forget the necessity and they become my obsession. Now, if you have to, if that is the thing, that my necessity gets obsession, then the, ultimately to have that real bliss in life, Happiness in life, that is the necessity for all of us. And that is possible only through being detached. So why not try again and again to be detached so that this re repeated attempt of trying to be detached, this becomes an obsession. So if duty is, an obs duty is nothing but an obsession, an obsession which we have named it, we have flowered it, we have just covered it with the flower and said it's duty. If that's the real fact, then why not make this your duty to be unattached and to work as free beings, to give up all work unto God. So let this be your obsession. Convert it into your obsession. As Swami, as Sri Ramakrishna used to say, kata diye kata toda. Karma yoga is also a part of this world, but it can take you beyond it. How? Sri Ramakrishna used to give a nice example. Suppose a thorn has pricked you to get to get rid of that thorn. What do you do? I just pluck another thorn from the same plant of the same thorn bush, thorny bush. I pluck one thorn and with that I prick out the, the thorn which has pierced me. I prick out that thorn. After that, both the thorns are of no use. I throw them. So if all the so-called sense of duty is actually nothing but obsession, get rid of that obsession with this new obsession, that yes, my only motive for action is to be detached. Let me make this my new obsession by constantly trying. And once I succeed, then all action falls off. There's no need for actions. Till then, I cannot stop. The actions has to be with me. So the only true duty to be unattached is to be unattached and to work as free beings, to give up all work unto God. All our duties, sorry, all our duties are His. Blessed are we that we are ordered out here. We serve our time, whether we do it ill or well, who knows? If we do it well, we do not get the fruits, if we do it well, neither do we get the care. Be at rest, be free and work. There's a nice song written by, nice hymn written by Swamiji, Ambastotra. There the last line is very interesting. That Samba, O Parvati, O the mother, O the consort of Siva, O Samba, Shiva, Mamagati. You are my final resort. Safale, Afaleva. Whether I succeed in the worldly sense or whether I am a failure, ultimately you are my goal. Even in my spiritual journey, if I succeed or I fail, you are my goal. Samba, Shiva, Mamagati, Safale, Faleva. It's a perfect resignation that I am doing what you impel me to do. But at last, it's in your lap. Where is my place? At, when the game is over, where is the place of my rest? So you are my gati. You are my final refuge. Safale afaleva. I'm just doing as per the way you are impelling me to do. But I know that this means nothing. It's just as Holy Mother used to say, that never think that by doing little japam, God is your slave. He will come down to you that as you have done 10,000 japam. Always have the feeling that I have renounced the so-called worldly ways of living. Now with my free time, what to do? I have nothing to do, so I am doing japa. I am just doing my spiritual practice so that my mind has needs something to remain engaged, so I am keeping engaged. 
but even for that lord will be pleased with me as i am doing japa never have that feeling just have a sense of resignation all these actions are his or her the lords uh, the way he has impelled the world he has impelled me the others are doing in some other way i am doing in some other way but it has nothing to do with my liberation she or he is the one who is beyond all law of causation that nothing that with this i get it that is not possible he is the one who is free it is only out of compassion it is he or she if you i take the lord as feminine it is she or if i take him as the the uh, as the male it is a he whatever way you may take the god uh, you can just have as you wish you can just think of him as you wish so with the lord out of compassion with also unconditional grace his grace is not conditioned that only through sadhana i can get him then his grace becomes conditioned it is unconditional whom he will grace how he will grace when he will grace i don't know i am just doing as you impel me to do but my ultimate destiny is you and you alone so if we do it well we do not get the fruits if we do it ill neither do we get the care be at rest be free and work this kind of freedom is a very hard thing to attain again and again swami is indicating it is difficult but it is not impossible climbing the mount everest is difficult it's not impossible don't just again and again equate a difficulty with impossibility or impracticality don't do that strive on strive on again and again at last we all will succeed how easy it is to interpret slavery as duty the morbid attachment of flesh for flesh as duty that's all our necessities gets converted into duty that swami ji will give an example men go out into the world and struggle and fight for money and for any other thing to which they get attached ask them why they do it they say it is duty it's a morbid attachment to the obsession which has got converted into a sense of duty as we told it is just like flowering covering the corpse with the flower but the word duty is that it is the absurd greed for gold and gain and they try to cover it with a few flowers that's the word which swami is coming to what is duty after all it is really the impulsion of the flesh of our attachment and when an attachment has become established we call it duty so this is the obsession which is converted into duty and now he is giving an example for instance in countries where there is no marriage there is no duty between husband and wife when marriage comes husband and wife live together on account of attachment and that kind of living together becomes settled after generations and when it becomes so settled it becomes a duty it is so to say a short of chronic disease which is in all when it is acute we call it disease when it is chronic we call it nature <laughs> so swami is in a very wonderful way he is just going to the point very point blank just removing all the flowers to see the corpse as it is it is saying when it is acute we call it disease when it is chronic we call it nature swabhava that's again swami ji is actually referring to the idea of duty as has been enunciated in the bhagavad gita when bhagwan is saying that all the various classifications as per the varnas we seen it's actually the classification as per our duties the brahmana kshatriya vaishya and the shudra as per our sense of duties this classification is there and again this why we do a duty in a particular way it is because again of the swabhav that our inherent tendencies create that swabhava that in turn creates the sense of duty so that in the 41st shloka of the 18th chapter bhagwan says that how this four varnas are formed with a different senses of duty it's because of the swabhava brahmana kshatriya vishang shudranam cha parantapa karmani pravibhaktani swabhava prabhavair gunai swabhav prabhavair gunai as per the swabhav so all these obsessions taking the form of duty of the swabhav and the swabhav becomes my duty as per that 
I am either a Brahman or a Kshatriya. I am either, as per my Swabhava, a so-called the intelligent, the intelligence uh, tank of the society. I may be a scholar. I may be a research scholar, or Kshatriya, like the those who are looking after the government, the administration, Vishang, the economic class, and Shudra, the so-called the working class. Uh, it's there in all the societies, in all the societies, when whatever name we may call them, it is there. And it actually, as per our nature, we decide what type of work we will consider as our duty and thrive in the society. So that's why all the professions in Sanskrit is called vritti. The word vritti means is very interesting. That by which I sustain myself, a doctor sustains himself by his medical service. He is doing service to the society, but ultimately it is he is sustaining himself. An engineer sustains by being an engineer. A teacher sustains himself by being a teacher. And that's why that word vritti is used for your thoughts. If the thoughts are not there, your mind is not there. So what sustains your mind? Those thoughts. That's why thoughts are called vritti. It's very scientific. So this is the idea of this profession. The vritti comes from my urge to sustain myself as this limited psychophysical wings. It is actually an obsession which we are covering with the flower in the name of duty. Then how can we get rid of this sense of duty? No. With this sense of duty, keeping that, uh, that as intact, taking the responsibilities in which I have been placed through karma yoga, I can spirally move upwards. So that's again, Swamiji will be referring to a Bhagavad Gita sloka to discuss that idea that how to get rid of this disease. I cannot simply just as we say that sometimes in the name of spirituality, we throw the baby along with the dirty water of the bathtub. That's not the way out. If you have headache, you cannot simply cut off the head. That is not the way out. I have to accept that this as an integral part of me, my nature, whatever may be the reason which has resulted it, it is my nature. I cannot jump out of it. Accepting that, how can I transcend that? So that again is being indicated by Bhagavan in the Gita in the 46th sloka of the 18th chapter as he is about to conclude the lessons of Bhagavad Gita in the 18th chapter. In the 46th sloka, he will mention that. And that the portion which Swamiji will be referring to, to continue with his uh, conclusion, or this uh, conclusion, uh, conclusive uh, remarks of this Karma Yoga, uh, he will take up from the next paragraph. So today uh, we are almost, the time is up. We will take up that with this idea that as per Swabhava, we are bound to do the so-called duties of our life. And what's the way out? Where Karma Yoga comes to picture? What's the way out of it? That's the thing which we will again take up in the next class uh, and we will most probably trying to complete this chapter in the next class with the conclude uh, this conclusion remarks of swamiji in this regard of uh, uh, duty that the duty is something which is a limitation but we can go beyond this limitation by not forsaking our duty by doing the same duty with a different attitude that karma yoga springs of speaks of attitudinal correction attitudinal change it's not changing the way of your life what you all the professions of life you still continue to be there still doing what you are doing but with the change of your attitude you are you have known the trick to come out of the this so called conglo, this what is called this called conglomerate called this world you come out of it that's the way that's uh, out of it. That's the Karma Yoga. It's, uh, in the Gita that has been told that, uh, that that's the trick, that that's the way out. The Karma Yoga is shows the way out by bringing that attitudinal correction. So we will take that part again in the next class before we conclude this chapter on Karma Yoga, namely the freedom. Thank you all. Namaskar.